Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Product Charter podcast. Uh, well, we were live in Pune, hey, a few weeks ago with our first Mixer event on storytelling. And that's why we've been, we've been away for the past few weeks. But yeah, now we are back. Uh, the Mixer event went great. Lots of fun and inspiring stories uh, combined with great audience and friends and good food and good beer. Uh, we couldn't have asked for more, right? Right, guys? What do you think? How did that go? Yeah, yeah. Thank you to everyone who came in there and uh, sorry that we are getting back so late after the Mixer event. It took a while, but okay, I hope you can forgive us. I think it was really awesome to at least have an in-person event and to to add on to it, our delay, it's more about we were getting out of that hangover, right? So that was the yeah. idea. <laughs> yes, I think that, that was my line too, uh, just getting out of the hangover. <laughs> Uh, And if you missed that event, I I mean, if you were not in Pune, we did put a little video on our YouTube channel, if you'd like to check out some photos from that event. So yeah, go for it. But yeah, we are back on the podcast today. And today's podcast is about, well, one of my favorite topics, sketching. And how visual thinking can help in unblocking us and unlocking the creative side within us. Bazinga as Amir's t-shirt says. So, well, they say a picture speaks a thousand words and uh, the latter half I got to know from Amir that a different thousand to to each one of us. So I'd like to begin about, you know, what what do pictures and what do visualizations mean to to me and my family? And well, the Maliks are definitely in awe of visuals and visual thinking. Uh, My daughter started painting when she was two years old. Now she's seven and the first thing she does after waking up is grabbing a sheet and colors and then she starts to draw or, or you know, kind of indulge in coloring and painting. My son is four and his favorite pastime is with his oil pastels. My wife became a watercolor artist a couple of years ago. Well, Mohit was at my place last week and he saw some of her paintings. And while I am no artist, my favorite place in any new city I visit is the art museum. And I should tell you that I do a lot of sketching and scribing. We'll probably go through that during the podcast today. So it won't be unfair to say that visuals play a very important part in my life. But I'm keen to hear what visuals and visual thinking mean for all of you guys. And and what is their, what's the role of that in in your life? So Mohit, let's begin with you. What's your story? I'll give you a brief background to people. Uh, You know, I was literally very bad at drawing since my first early days in school and then carrying it on my engineering days. Literally, I, I used to struggle to even, you know, draw a straight line. And it's it's a it's a being very open to you folks. And and you know, when I when I moved across things, I realized, you know, where I'm stuck, you know, where where my mental block is or where do things actually do not land up in the way I, I want to. That's where, you know, the power of visualization, the power of sketching became important. And, and, you know, I just started sketching with, uh, you know, like I'm not a techie in, in that using a lot of fancy tools. I always look to use a pen and paper and now, you know, some of the tools which, which are there. But somewhere, if you see, even in, in the roles that, that I play, you know, be it discoveries, be it designs and where you are trying to interact with the users, I think it's, it's a, there's no second thought how powerful that tool is, if, if you ask me, right? At least in my side, I have seen, you know, it brings in a lot of clarity in my thoughts, right? That That's the important thing. Uh, you know, it helps me to connect the dots. It's more of a self-evaluation, if I have to call in, right? Uh, to be convinced about what I'm I'm drawing or what I'm even proposing to someone, right? Um, so just summing it up, I think it's, it's one of the most powerful things. And I always see a learning curve into it. And, you know, I always preempt people, okay, go ahead and draw something, right? Like, it gives you a lot of relaxation. On personal level, it has helped me a lot. And yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I love sketching. And as we always call, you know, it's the best friend for a product person is is sketching or a drawing. Uh, we, we always call it, yeah. Nice one, Mohit. Cool, Amaya, what about you? Are you yeah, a painter, awesome. sketcher? Yeah. Okay. So I I figured much later that I was good at drawing. 
but uh, let me tell you guys this sketch noting and uh, visual thinking etc actually does not mandate you to be good at it okay so don't don't feel left out at all the first theorem actually for visual thinking says that you start with four shapes the typical uh, triangle square line and dot and all you do is just label them so that is absolutely fine if you can draw those basic shapes and start visually thinking um which i feel is a quite a de- difficult technique so i don't think i've reached there yet to start visually thinking because there are two parts to it one is of course the visual uh, symbolizing everything what people tend to do is that uh, they simply translate now instead of writing a flower like f l o w e r they would actually just draw draw a flower but that's not the intent of visual thinking uh, you would probably want to describe it a little bit more what maybe there is a smiley face on the flower or whatever it is right a happy flower a shield flower whatever uh so i think visual thinking as a technique takes some time to develop but i'll tell you i'll tell you some things i was not the sharpest of the students okay i took a really long time to understand some of the basic concepts also and uh, history and geography were my weak subjects everything else was fine my maths was okay my science was fine in fact uh, quite surprisingly my chemistry was also okay i must have inherited that from my father but uh, history and geography i had a very tough time especially i don't i did not understand why we were made to remember the chronology order of certain events of historical events including the wars which were like 14 1600s till whatever time and uh, it took me a really long time to mug them up so as a practice one of the teachers history teachers said you start writing and use that as a memory exercise and uh, i started doing that then i realized that when i was writing i was able to retain things much faster so i used to write very selectively and automatically kind of developed a habit that if i want to retain something much easier and much quickly um, then i would just simply write Uh, on the other hand uh, then a great geography teacher came out of came out of nowhere and then she actually started drawing things while she was talking and explaining on the board and that blew me off and i was that concept was so novel to me i did not even know that you could teach in that manner and literally the whole class was hooked on to that method and obviously she turned out to be a costly teacher and this my school could not afford it so she had to move out but uh, that's where my exposure to sketching has started as a learning tool so i realized that for my sake if i have to move from abstract concepts to concrete concepts and probably uh, move between the two uh, i realized that uh, sketching was uh, quite helpful that uh, is also something that i do as well so especially the books that i like or things that i feel that there are a lot of things for me to take away i actually mm. write down a lot of that book as well so i started mm. doing that i mean you probably did that for your notes right yeah in, in school i'm still doing that <laughs> i'm still doing <laughs> that for a lot of books that i'm reading but now i've started to do a little a, a bit more digitally because i ran out of real estate uh, <laughs> so i i thought i, I probably yeah, i use one note quite often so but anyways yeah i'm it keen to hear your story well uh I think my love for comics is uh, known. I I was hooked on to comics very young, and uh, Chacha Chaudhary and uh, Raj comics, or be that Mandrake or or the Archies. Uh, at some point of time, I was uh, bored, and what I would do is I was also a little bad at sketching, so I would just outline these characters, and then uh, at some point, I said, okay. I'll draw those characters and I'll make them say what I want them to say. So nice. those were the times. Uh, yeah, geography things because you also have to learn. So you have the Chacha Chaudhary and then you have other uh, comic characters. Uh, I'm sketching them out and then I'm writing more. I've been more of a writer than a sketching guy. So my visual thinking came from. more a comics world where you had two action figures one telling other guy hey what is euler's theorem and then the other guy says okay this is euler's theorem so yeah and that was my uh, trick to learn it uh and yes that's a product there, right there by the way that's a product right there yeah well if you find in the field fire you know if you look hard enough this product in everything uh-huh. but yeah cut back to 
the you know professional days and then i was um, at ea sports and then um, we were uh, doing a lot of sketching there we were working with designers and uh, unless you could express yourself in at least uh, drawing and and you know what the next frame will be it was difficult to communicate with the designer and the developer so that became a necessity and i i have enjoyed that process overall and even today uh, i i'm still a pen and paper person uh, very uncomfortable with the new tools so and and it is still strictly for my personal use uh, my you know visual design process so that's that's a little bit insight onto my journey of things that's brilliant yeah amit and you know i think uh, like what you both were saying right like children or when we are young we kind of start drawing things well uh, you know we kind of uh, that's some medium for us to express our thoughts mm-hmm. uh, and it's really nice for me to be able to see that in my children picking that up uh, so let me show you a little sketch that my daughter drew for me when she was 5 years or actually she had not just she had not even turned 5 but she was about to turn 5 and do you see it awesome yeah. hey and, that's i mean that's yeah. that's so like cute in in a very in thoughtful a, yeah yes. but in a thoughtful and like it brings so much of her uh thinking and you know what she feels about happiness and 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 you know characters and clouds and rainbow and and none of this was something that you know we preempted or things like that even for uh, equal experts she's Uh, you know uh, she she made a little uh, sketch that i sent for uh, during a kind of a t-shirt design competition that a lot of people love so i think it, it's just so natural to humans to sketch and express their feelings somewhere down the line as we grow we kind of lose that skill but i think hopefully mm-hmm. that's what you want to bring back from this podcast right mm-hmm. <laughs> cool so i'll get back uh so i think yeah, that was uh, very nice to hear about what sketching and what visual thinking means for you i want to slightly take the topic to about you know what a bit more about sketching let's go a bit deeper into sketch and in what areas do we use sketching It's like personally i love to sketch anything that Uh, especially when when it's anything that's to do with complexity or you know something that's very not not non linear the like complex mm-hmm. subjects often involve you know multiple interconnected components and sketching just helps me kind of visualize these relationships more intuitively and explain them to others also more easily because i've got some tool or i've got some medium to be able to express that and the other area that i'm very fond of sketching is storytelling and uh, creative thinking Like we have done workshops right on on design sprints and storytelling and and your sketching and you know takes that whole storyboarding and storytelling aspect to the next level and i can't imagine which other medium if it was not for you know storytelling i would choose if i didn't have that at my disposal so yeah i think that that's i that's why i feel sketching is that very powerful tool but with what is your experience a bit more about you know how sketching helps you with your day to day and also if you can tell us i know you're fan of pen and paper and is that what you kind of use more like a day to day or you've also started to use some tools and you're you, you're seeing some benefits using those tools yeah sure so I, i'll tell you i think i echo with your thoughts where you said you know for me also sketching is you know you can sketch anything right it it need not to do with it has to be related to my product what i'm working my day to day things at least what i have felt is you know in my case sketching helps me to focus also right like uh, where when you sketch something you also get that time and and you might be you know having lot of nuances but when you sketch you at least are at peace from your head and and you are trying to put that across right mm. uh, so that's one of the thing when i said you can sketch anything i'll tell you day before yesterday you know like in our uh, one of the engagements we are struggling with stakeholders so you know it's like rotating moving and all that stuff and and you know what i did was just got into the miro you know i quite use it right now and so just sketch some bits give it a picture which was being discussed for last one week right so so what i'm trying to say is again it might be linked to the remote ways of working but definitely if you try to sketch draw something which not 
which is not as beautiful what you like to be even if it's in a raw state and communicates what you intends to it is so powerful right something that has taken multiple discussions to come up with a consensus is done very soon so um and, and that's one part of it second part is you shouldn't judge yourself while you are sketching right so it, it's always that we get into a notion okay this box is looking beautiful or or this character which i'm telling is it actually the same uh trust me these are immaterial when you try to sketch and try to pass on your ideas right um at least i have seen when you when you sketch it and then you sketch it in a way where you're trying to plot the message and everything and that's the part of the product uh, people also right the message or the articulation should go in uh, that's the key part one last bit so i'll i'll also try to demystify a lot of people link sketches to you know uh, the wireframes low fi's high fi's and lot of other stuff somewhere if you ask me right you know those come later in the cycle uh, unless you have done a fair bits of focus on sketching and you have put in your thoughts i think those are just putting up your thoughts in a fancy tools if you ask me you know uh, that's why you know as product people i i always feel we should you know whatever meetings we do whatever you know discussions we go and and we try to think it from a user perspective uh i think to to have a concise view it's always important to sketch and then you can go across with the uh, you know those frames another bit is which we always juggle in our job related things is whose baby is this sketching is right is it product designer product manager or we have ux people i mean i i always struggle to actually you know understand what is why this is a contention point right like as we always call in it has to be everyone's baby you can call it a shared baby in this case somewhere i've seen lot of uh, you know value added when both designers and product people are working together on sketching and there are exceptions where your designers are not there they could be a small setups and you know where you do not have all those rules even if you plot something and you can communicate the message it's doing the job right so uh, these are few of the things uh, you know what to sketch and you know how to sketch and how to relate it to your day to day lives I think that's a very cool point. I mean, and it doesn't need to be limited to you know product managers and designers. I mean, I've I've seen some you know fantastic developers trying to just present their thinking in a very visual way that makes the kind of you know enriches the conversation and, and kind of builds a lot of empathy. Kind of uh, presenting their thoughts through that medium. So yeah, totally agree, Mohit. And I think there's also misconception around B two B versus B two C where the sketching is applicable or even into the Uh, uh-huh. you know the user uh, interface <laughs> application I, i somewhat feel people think you know sketching is not applicable if you are working on something like data which is all back end driven right or something where you might have enterprise users and you know people just bring in shabby screens just to say okay they just need to click and do their work uh, somewhere i see sketching has a lot of role to play there it has lot of power is just that how you sketch it and how you make it centric to those specific users matters a lot you know that that was useful uh i mean i'm keen to hear especially about you know so, uh, like have remote world have you started to use some new tools so how, i'm just i'm just, realize, i'm just realizing i'm just realizing that this entire podcast series is going to be quite self deprecating for me i don't know why it is going that way but it really looks like it is going that way but okay so uh, for the longest amount of time uh, i was not able to so this comes from focus that uh, mohit was talking about um because i had a lot of shared responsibilities and i was accountable for multiple things i was not able to kind of just put my head on to some problem solving and then kind of get to it while i was solving a problem i used to constantly think about okay what next and then what do i do somewhere else and uh, then again sketching helped me there to just slow down you know so i mean the reason why I don't know if children use uh, I don't have my own kids so I don't know if children today use a lot of pen and paper beyond art or not uh, but the reason why they enforce kind of to use your hand even in design thinking that let the hand do the thinking don't think don't talk do more uh, yeah. I really love what design thinking preaches about that and uh, at the end of the day I kind of helps me just focus and channelize everything into one particular thing so problem solving is definitely one area i use a lot of sketching in of course then what are a lot of assets within design thinking like service blueprint is also one of my favorites which kind of 
covers the entire map of uh, how your product services or service offering is structured uh, across different customer segments so that is something which i kind of it's a continuous sketch it's an evolving sketch uh, and it stays like that so with thanks to digital tools like notion and uh, figma and miro etc you are able to do that more freely now uh, but yeah i think my ground or the rough work always starts with a pen and paper um so yeah i do wonder at times that if it's just us like this generation uh, maybe we are all just 5 years apart but um uh, <clears throat> this generation maybe is more used to pen and paper as opposed to the digital tools because i have worked with young engineers who come with an ipad and a digital pen and they would still sketch but they would do it on a digital medium i think it would still end up giving the same effect but i somehow just like that whole the scratching of the pen on the paper uh the smell of the ink and everything it's it's like the whole experience right so when it comes to when you're writing everything so yeah professionally speaking the whole ui ux aspect problem solving empathy journey mapping that is something there are these are the common tools because we do a lot of validation uh, of the problem uh, identifying what is to be solved etc and on the personal level yes focus is one very very important thing that i do that one more downside so I, wow it's like so i am color blind okay so um it i don't have a very serious condition it's like a protanomaly uh, it's third grade so i can't really distinguish between red and green when it uh, like they're very close to each other so the shades of that so very early on i was ve- like used to symbolizing things so i used to work better with shapes than the actual color of it so now you can imagine that my chemistry experiments and observing those copper rings on the test tubes etc was a nightmare for me okay it i used to be like scared okay. and okay. hope that my presentation exercises <laughs> yeah man it's so like what is the acidity level and i was like okay let me just guess it <laughs> whatever it is and i was just right it so yeah so i i think symbolizing it and uh, pictorially or visually kind of depicting things what i wanted started very early on and that's what i've continued in my professional life also that's what i sketch and pretty much everything now i sketch for time pass also time pass in the sense like really trivial problems and uh, maybe through, uh, later in the podcast maybe i'll showcase that as well cool that that makes made a lot of sense and yeah i mean if when i try to sketch that it helps me in focusing but it also distracts me because then i just keep on <laughs> sketching and you know it takes me to a, 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 it makes me kind of spend time in just busy doing that rather than kind of getting back on back, back to my work but amit what's your story uh, could you share a bit more well, about I, how you uh, sketching day to day i like what uh, amit says focus uh, mm. when i was a project manager and i was uh, kind of doing a lot of various you know handling teams and handling um, deadlines and handling customers so it, it was a multi focus multi headed hydra and then when moved to a product management role i realized that uh, i didn't have a lot of these things but i if there was a problem i had to go very deep into it mm-hmm. and you know uh, probably it was you were you were given a statement you were given a problem and you need to find out a solution to it so sketching helped me there to kind of right. compartmentalize the problem or chunking as you know absolutely say. Yeah, make totally it smaller right. you know go deeper uh, make it uh, uh, so so if you are saying that hey design a new email system or design a new uh, game then what are the various aspects of it will there be a front end there will be a back end or or all sorts of those things so uh, visualization helped me that and uh, while yes pen and paper and yeah pen and paper have their merit but then professionally as a product manager these tools of design thinking miro dashboard i've helped to kind of structure my thoughts i i would go on the spiral hole of monish like you that you know okay let's start with this sketch and then you know your, your thoughts wander you know like, like a cloud or whatever but then uh, how to bring that back and how to structure yeah. it so yeah. there is a merit in those tools i and we have af- only after using them i realized that um, these tools are good plus uh, you know so so there is merit and then i've been using them quite often these days especially user story mapping tools uh i remember your workshop on design thinking mm-hmm. and designs sprint 
uh, I have been trying to imbibe some of those ideas uh, through visualization in my work. And that helps uh, to for you to kind of talk to various stakeholders, uh, various departments. So yeah, that's, that's a little my professional side of how I've used uh, visual thinking. That's brilliant, Amit. And cool. So yeah, Amit, that was really lovely. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, now, probably the most interesting part of today's podcast, we can't be talking about sketching and visualization and not doing or showing some of it, right? And that'll be, that'll be a shame. <laughs> so here's a chance to showcase some of that. Uh, so, you know what, I mean, let me start with you. Uh, would you like to, you know, do a bit of a show and tell for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll show you one. So I was talking about time pass sketching, right? So I'll start, let me start with that. But the underlying message is quite strong. And you guys, I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not, not because we haven't spoken about this. So I can do one, then someone else should go after me and then I'll do one more. Okay. So for the longest time, and even today, I'm not a fan of open offices. Okay. I hope that is explosive enough for you guys, but because I think open <laughs> offices are heavily misconstrued in India and I don't think we do it right. Um, I think we have just taken it to another level of wherein we just want to peep into each other's screens and we just want to make sure our uh, subordinates are working. Okay. And that's, that's most yes. common thing that's happening in offices. Um, and I, I do believe strongly that the only reason why people don't come to offices is open offices. Um, uh, People are loving the privacy that they get at their homes. So we decided to prove it. I mean, at least I decided to prove it with a sketch. Now, yeah. So what we uh, did was, okay. we did a very simple exercise. Okay. Let me explain what this is. This is the aisle of our office where we enter from. And this is exactly the number of seats that are there in the office. Okay. And I had to prove this. We have this really odd pillar in between. Uh, we don't know what to do with it. We can't put it down, pull it down as well. So I had to prove it to them that people have preferences where they get maximum privacy. So if you look at it, when when there were when there were no team base, like they were not assigned locations on where people will sit, people chose the places that they could sit in. And then we then I started highlighting those places which got filled first and the first five. And then you saw that the, the places which were in the corners got filled the first. Okay, and then the open areas kind of started to go there. So it was a very, very simple sketch exercise just to show them as to like I have evidence to show you that open offices don't work. Then all that we did was we I created these small tables, okay, the same tables of the same equal sizes. Okay. So all that we did was this is the table and we just put the table on top of this. We replaced this table with this table. And then we started to play around. Okay, why did we play around is because if people choose consciously the corner seatings, right, let's maximize that and give more people the corner seatings. And that's what we did. So we used these tiles um, as tables and flipped them around and saw if we could actually, I mean, moving those tables was like big job. So moving the tiles on the paper was much easier. Right. So, so sketching is quite affordable. It's quite portable uh, and it's fun. So you can do this fun exercise and find out really it was an experiment and it did work. And I still believe that open offices are a mess. They are not the best productivity hacks <laughs> that offices could have brought to teams. And that's my showcase. That's design. That's design thinking at its best. Uh, that, that that was brilliant. I mean that that was like uh, quick prototyping, or rather, you know, at least a sketch yeah. of what you intended to do, and ran a bit of an experiment right. and came up with right. learning. That right. was brilliant. Yeah, and and yes, that is controversial. That reminds me of some <laughs> research actually that has happened on this, which I'll send that to you, since it's not related to the topic. Uh, but but yeah, that. I that hope really your cool. hypothesis was proven right after you know this. Did we? see something changing on the people coming down to office or some other measures to actually see a change into it and anything that uh, you observed Ame, after this 
after they flipped the tables we we still saw people picking uh-huh. the private spots first and it's just that because we flipped the tables in a manner that there were more private spots than before uh, it kind of worked in everyone's favor uh, but there's no reasoning to this i mean it's not like what they consciously choose it's just that this is where they feel that they would have maximum uh, rather maximum focus and minimum distractions and maybe also not a lot of peeping toms onto their screens so yeah and and that's that's where i re- so every office that i've been into uh including equal experts and thoughtworks and uh, my own office and tavaska and uh, a lot of offices in wtc who have kind of practiced this as thesis of open offices i don't think the outcomes are sketched very well anyway so yeah that was that design exercise cool and definitely a topic to chat about later after the podcast For sure. cool. so uh, i i can go next uh, and you know i'll probably talk about my experience uh, during the agile india 2020 conference i presented a talk which was on well pen and paper would you believe it yeah that that was my talk about and how and it, i presented a case study where how using a pen and paper we moved from you know a prototype to building a paper prototype to an actual product uh, so yeah i i will provide a link to that talk uh, after the podcast in in the description for people who are kind of interested to take a look at it but to talk a bit about that talk and and how we used pen and paper so the challenge in front of us was while i was working at springer nature it was that the you know researchers especially in the life scientists or you know biotechnologists the trying to find the right protocol for the life sciences experiments was a very daunting task a protocol is kind of a recipe right so just like how you have a a recipe to prepare a certain dish uh, a paneer tikka or a rajma chawal or whatever uh, scientists have you know protocol with some list of steps and and visualizations pictures kind of things that we do in a lab so you do all those steps and you conduct that experiment and a researcher may spend hours sometimes hundreds of hours in a year only to find the right protocol that she would then be able to make it work in her environment so we were trying to solve that solve for that problem and for prototyping our solution we used a technique called paper prototypes and let me show you my uh, kind of present my screen to to talk about what a uh, paper prototype actually it's kind of similar to what ame has shown already uh, but i have a nice gif image that uh, uh, that that i find quite helpful to explain people do you see it yeah cool so uh, if you see my screen then you know as uh, uh, you can see in the image what's happening on the paper prototype is that the paper prototypes involve sketching uh, designs on paper and seeing how a user would interact with it so the facilitator would ask the user to perform a use case and using those prototypes as you can see in the image based on what the user presses the prototype kind of changes and by altering the current sketch or by introducing Fancy. new screens or or, or, or snippets uh, uh, yeah but we 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 tried that quite often actually when i was working at uh, uh, springer i was also we tried that in the macpillan education australia bit as well uh, yeah and 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 you know kind of become quite a big fan of it uh, so i do encourage you to talk about to kind of try it out and also you can listen to my talk where i've kind of explained that in more detail and uh, did my own demo this is amazing oh, cool uh so let me stop sharing monish do you know that now you have ai tools who can which can convert these designs into direct figma uh yeah wireframes yeah, i do yeah yeah yeah, yeah so th- that's brilliant actually so yeah you can you could now even yeah. do animations now maybe and and here are some yes. some of those you know prototypes that uh kind of utilized or uh, I kind of created for for my talk of course you can't see them oh. very clearly but that's what you will be able to see where i put a camera on the top and i tried to play around with these paper prototypes so i, I did that for that uh, agile india friend stock so I'll, i'll put that link over there but hopefully you get an idea right so you kind of have this and if the user has clicked on it then what will they search so the search for this what will be the results come so these results will kind of show up so kind of imitating the behavior of the user through through prototypes 
which have been created using pen and paper and scissors. Awesome. Uh, Very curious. Uh, how do your when you went and explained this? How does the audience perceive it? Were they able to use this or some certain point of it? Yeah, so I think it's one of the several techniques of prototyping, and you typically follow this up with a bit more high fidelity one, right? So, I mean, this is more like a very initial stage where you're kind of seeing how the user would interact with something like that. So, in our case, where we started with something as a paper prototype, we soon enough converted that to a digital prototype. Once we've got some basic validation of what the users like, what the, what are the kind of filters the users were using, or what was the kind of you know terms that the the uh, scientists were putting in the in the search box. Once we got some kind of a basic validation of our concept, then we created a kind of a search scraper created a more uh, digital version of a prototype so it also it kind of prototyping has its own journey uh, but it's yeah but this is a tool that i wanted to kind of present today that it's very very lightweight all you need is a pen and paper and and you can try to encourage you and users feel very safe when they are doing this i think that that's a very key part that i try to you know put across in my uh, talk as well like if you have created a you know sophisticated fancy website and you put it in front of the users sometimes they also feel oh, i'm get, you know I'm, I'm kind of user testing this and uh, so uh, some of the feedback might kind of factor that part that i don't want to be too critical about it because people have really invested in creating a a fancy website creating a fancy prototype but when you've created something you know in in a matter of a couple of hours and created something using pen and paper users are more honest and they'll kind of use this as a more fun activity but at the same time you can get very useful feedback of 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 this as well no, i think uh, really awesome Manish I think one thing I really liked about that was the simplicity it brings in right there's no overhead and it's more simple and anyone can do it there's no learning curve to learn a tool to put it place here and there absolutely and another thing from a user perspective this also avoids a lot of biasness right we we do not require any user to be techie or any other thing I think the key aspect that we always miss is that user is there to perform a particular task, right? And how we are simplifying it. I think that gives a real picture that this is where, whether it solves a problem or not, whether learning all the other peripheral, it's trying to understand that landscape way better and way simplified. Yeah, I really like this. Cool. Thanks, guys. That's really positive, good feedback. But and yeah, happy no, it's to awesome. Kind of talk about this more here. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so, so it takes this, what you have made, it actually takes time to make with hand and scissors, etc. Like yeah. It's proper craft, yeah. Yeah. right? So then people automatically think twice before because you cannot generate waste as you can generate digital waste. Like you can erase easily on Miro, you can do undo, redo, whatever you want. All those operations on digital tools, which you cannot on pen and paper. So yeah, automatically you have to think twice before you really want to do this, you really want to do that. And then decision making also becomes easy, which was nice. Yeah, I, I think I... there's another angle to it. So, uh, so you you can actually do this. You, yes, you it involves a bit of a prep, but you when you're doing a paper prototyping experiment, you actually keep paper, scissors, and pen yeah. at your disposal while you're doing that as well. So a lot of times right. you create those prototypes on the fly as well. So it it gives you an opportunity to you know be very nimble about it and create some you know. Uh, so yes, it needs some level of prep work, but at the same time not as complex as creating digital prototypes. And you can uh, you can kind of as I said, you know, uh, people will give you more honest feedback because they know they can see that that it, it's 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 a bit raw at that point in time. Correct. Anyways, Correct. Uh, won't take too much time from the podcast. I do have some more sketches which I'll present later towards the end of the podcast because we've kept some uh, uh, you know separate section about design thinking but I know Amir you want to showcase something more so back yeah yeah so so uh, Amit referred to the design sprint workshop that we had right and I just remember that I had made something from that so I was just flipping through my pages and let me just show you something um, so you remember we had this traffic problem which two of the teams had picked up, Mohit yep. and Munish. Uh -huh. So they yeah. picked up that. And then you, you remember we realized that they actually started ended up writing a lot of things. That there were no diagrams coming off, etc. Though we tried to tell them that take a very focused problem and stuff like that. So this is, this is actually what I, I would have liked them to do. So what I've done is, this is my regular route to office. And I don't know whether you will recognize or maybe you won't. But this is Nagar Road. Viman Nagar and Chandan Nagar circles which are always clogged and they are the cause of the entire Nagar road traffic 
okay and the reason is are these arrows it's not about the congestion of the vehicles or the density of the vehicles on the road you see the freedom of movement on this road is crazy people can go literally in all four directions in all these areas and the distance between the two junctions is very less it's very low i think it is very easy to solve this problem uh, if you have to we could restructure the roads and entry and exit points on those roads and i think the problem would be solved but okay anyway i, I don't know if i can file an rti or something and tell them please allow me to <laughs> present something to you which we can experiment but i do realize that bombay police uh, is more responsive to such things uh, they they freely can shut those rows and then open this access make one ways and stuff like that to kind of manage the traffic better but for some reason the pune police is not uh, equipped or maybe they are not empowered enough to do that but anyway uh, let me go to the sketch which i really wanted to present and it has to do with all of us which is product charter um, wow. when i first uh, visualized uh, the podcast right this uh-huh. is what i wanted to make actually and then i realized that no podcast actually has uh, this kind of an ability or there is no framework or tool which is available to do that so this is this podcast banner etc we are on youtube spotify and linkedin uh you have one podcast which is the title of the podcast it would have chapters and the highlights of the podcast are there all are absolutely clickable and you go there this is the regular stuff right but this hierarchy also is something which i saw youtube does not have spotify does not have mm-hmm. um and it would be nice to kind of just link all of this together in a frame like mm-hmm. this is a single podcast you have the whole podcast here you have chapters here and you have highlights here these are those 90 second clips that we prepare right out of those um mm-hmm. uh, so i kind of realized that and then then i realized that there is a lot of video content getting generated do you see that how many podcasts there are like thousands of podcasts right now but do you see do you, can you envision the loss of information because it is not getting written the scripts are getting auto generated which uh, if you remember munish uh, slack did that you exchange we exchange Correct. some video and slack automatically generated that script and maybe documented that video associating with that particular script and subtitles and stuff stuff like that and that is exactly what I, what i wanted to exploit so imagine you click on the podcast you have the title with that particular chapter now you are viewing that chapter the chapter would have segments not a lot of segments of course it would otherwise become a lot of actions and then drill down and stuff like that then i won't really expect users to remember where they started from etc so you have the chapter and the segments but when you are playing a segment this is the discussion forum and i don't i don't understand why this is not there like if you have viewers for, for podcast engagement is not just about likes okay i mean and i think that is and uh, i mean that is one thing about social media which i've never really understood like and that is why also i think what elon musk does not like is like he does not like bots so if you're just gauging your social media uh in, like success of social media by likes and subscribers and uh, impressions uh, i'm not really sure how much of i mean until you actually translate that stuff into uh or monetize that i'm not really sure how much of a good metric that is especially not for us i mean not for the product chatter but if you have engagement of this sort where people are actually discussing look what munish said at this particular point and this is what i have to say and i have to re- i have to respond to munish uh like to saying dude like what are you talking i don't agree with you and stuff like that uh that can happen on youtube but then youtube is like a flat list of comments and a lot of shit posts happen on that anyway So yeah this is this was something which i sketched and um, i think that is a product idea too uh, if you can if you can actually build a podcast platform dedicated for podcast which kind of gathers the intelligence from what gets spoken because right now everything is in um, everything is in video and uh, videos yeah. are not sir they are not searchable they are not indexable correct so, correct um, correct so yeah maybe ai will work I on that and then scripts will be indexable stuff but yeah, I, yeah yeah that was one concept i just wanted to show that yeah no it's great that how you were able to show it through sketching and made us understand what you wanted to say so clearly right like and that that was that was really cool and uh, especially enjoyed or basically you could relate to the part of i mean th- things definitely you can turn on the captions that you can see what's really is being spoken but the ability to be able to make the transcription searchable 
right. and, and you know, hey, if I'm looking for content around, let's say, design thinking, and for me exactly. to be able to, yes, it, it can break it down to those chapters, but actually trying to be able to search that tra- transcription yeah. is also very, very cool and having conversations around it. But yeah, what do you guys think, Mohit, Amit? No, I think definitely there, there is, as Amay already mentioned, you know, this is a product idea, right? Something for a thought, uh, you know, somewhere, even if you see any of the podcasts or any places, if you want to get to that specific area and you have a limited time, so that indexation helps a lot, right? It It's as simple as, you know, how you can completely get to the problem rather than looking at the periphery, right? If you, if you ask mm. me, that's what we juggle across. Okay, beat around the bush look across okay here it could be a lot of guesses assumptions presumptions and and i see you know if podcast can bring in that way okay if you want to like you gave an example of let's say you're you know a sketching or drawing in the school and we have talked multiple instances about it and and someone thinks what could be a good sketch look like they can directly go to okay three minutes and these many seconds definitely i think uh podcast platform should have this unless there is a compelling reason or a as we call in in our day-to-day lives, there is a technical limitation of not doing it. <laughs> I, that's the, that's People are the tagging day. it these days, so uh, yeah, it's not on the it's not generated on the actual tra- transcript like how Manish said. Uh, pe- people have to voluntarily themselves supply tags to their podcasts, and that's what we are also doing anyway. I mean, so if you want to be so, yeah, I I think uh, you bring up a very valid point, and why some of these existing platforms are not able to do, be that YouTube, be that Spotify, because they are not maybe podcast first platforms. Mm -hmm. They are meant for consuming content in a singular direction. Mm -hmm. uh, Very much record and consume. YouTube YouTube definitely is from uh, almost 97, 98. So yeah, it's, it's a old tool. And Spotify and other tools are also they were meant for streaming music. So I think uh, having a tool which uh, helps podcast listeners not only search content or look at various clips of content would be helpful. Mm. What is interesting is that I could come to this realization by seeing your visual design. Correct. Mm. And that was the key point. So, uh, when you were talking about all of these things, so and and it truly uh, the old age like Bazinga, picture yeah. is worth a thousand <laughs> words. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's how we can come to find new problems. Correct. Uh, and also, so yeah, I mean, I want to highlight one point. Sorry, Mohit. Uh, so I did did do want to highlight one point is that uh, people do sketch sometimes but uh, insufficient sketching actually kind of kills the purpose entirely like if you have to support that with a paragraph then you rather just write a paragraph than sketch of it so people would draw blocks and then just blocks and connect them with arrows etc the minimal that they can do but if it if i think if like how munish introduced right if the sketch is not speaking a thousand words then i think it's a problem then you rather just write those thousand words <laughs> <laughs> cool i think this was brilliant uh i'm glad Mohit, we you're you were saying something yeah. i was just saying it memorizing part of it right like whenever you know the seating plan is discussed i'll definitely remember you know this visual that you shared i mean and then as well as you know some of these paper prototypes so i think one of the key thing is anywhere uh, at least until we are conscious enough or i am conscious and i'm pretty sure you know these pictures are shared i would be able to memorize okay what was the context what was the reason behind that what we were trying yeah, to because we think visually right so we are, we, yeah. we have visual memories visual, in our, in our uh, minds. visual muscles muscles act you know more friendly and they have a more uh, i can call it a shelf life to to sustain that info yeah that was... cool cool so i think i'm going to move on to the next topic and probably extend these thoughts slightly more uh, the next thing that i want to talk about is the science of holding a pen and paper uh, and, you know, interestingly, I was looking that we have scientific study proving that pen and paper beats stylus and, and screen for memory retention. Some of the topics mm-hmm. that we are talking about through the podcast, uh, even though both modes involve handwriting and, you know, one using a, a, a you know, kind of a pen on paper and the other one using a stylus on a tablet. 
the pen and paper leads to greater brain activity you know as mohit was talking about and and, and memory retention uh similarly there are studies indicating that handwriting notes offers a wealth of benefits that typing does not so the benefits of handwriting start at a very young age again a topic that we've touched earlier where early listen, uh, early kind of learners and you know hone their fine motor skills by tracing the shapes of letters that's what my 4 year old is doing right now tracing a b etc uh and when students understand their letters they can communicate their unique ideas better so studies and they were done on you know brain scans they have shown that more brain regions light up during handwriting instead of typing mm. uh which is a you know a great piece of research that i could get my hands on we'll try to send you know kind of share those links in in the description but i'm very curious to learn about you know what is your feedback on this you know kind of scientific aspect of using pen and paper do you think like that or have you had experience to kind of support this or 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 to kind of uh, contradict with this mohit i want to start with you sure so i definitely support it and you know i do have a 4 year old you know and i've seen his journey right in the school and and i'll i'll try to showcase that also you know initially first 6 months when he was trying see uh, one of the scientific thing is uh, you know in the early days they don't allow you to hold even a pen right like they always you know promote that you should hold crayons right it's it's all about how you hold it and you shouldn't even use any of those uh, sketch pens or any of those ball pens or anything and and you know uh, at least i had a learning curve there you know when when i used to go across and we used to understand okay how he's doing or how he's improving i think there are a lot of different things how you hold your pen and paper right like whenever he was uh, you know then the teacher and the educator who, who showed us right when when he was just starter and and holding the pen like it was vertically right and then you get a double line when you draw it i mean at least it gave me a lot of thoughts and then when you try to be a little more proficient into it and then you know the line becomes a single right so so what it really means is you know the the science of pen and paper is also a learning curve and we have seen you know how much they are promoting into schools and in you know any of the curriculums at least you know we have seen how the curriculums are changing at least we were not in that golden or diamond age where you know drawing sketching is given far more importance right uh uh all these things around memorizing or you know take talking about different things comes in later even the writing and all but drawing and sketching and, and the art of holding pen and paper is being one of the key things that are taught and and also you know it, it's it's taught across through different ways right when i say different ways it's about uh you know it also gives you a feel of relating yourself closely to the nature that that's one key part of thing uh, you know that i have realized so i'll just cut it short i think the key thing what i want to bring it out it it has lot of scientific reasons how you draw how you hold your pen and paper in what format is it vertically 90 degrees or some other degrees where it is resting right is is it on a thumb in between so there are lot of scientific reasons that also defines what state of mind you are and how you are improving so that that's one of the learnings i am also having along with my kid if you ask me so cool Amia, what do you think about it? So, uh, so I, I don't have a lot to say on this, but I can only say something. So, so you know how you when you walk and if you're not comfortable, how you change your shoes, uh, you buy better than uh, better shoes and try walk and you know break your shoes into uh, uh, by walking a little bit more. I think pens are exactly that. If you don't enjoy writing, please try changing your pen. Um, I I mean, so for the Okay, so I did not understand why certain pens were so expensive. Okay, not because of the brand, etc., but simply because what they are. Like, I mean, they some of the really good pens are really good. I mean, there is liter they they just flow on the paper, and you they make you want to write more. And uh, I really wish everybody kind of experiences that. Just go into a shop and uh, just just try out different pens and see what you like writing. Uh, yeah that would explain the science themselves i mean they would understand it themselves right. why the affinity of pen and paper I, exists 
this this makes me this reminds me of two people uh, and, and for, uh, you know uh, and I'll, we can try to reach out to them they they have a kind of a pen collection whom i know and they're so passionate about their pens the way they explain their pens and how passionate they are about writing and drawing and sketching <laughs> we definitely need to get them onto the podcast i'll tell you about them at some point uh but yeah they have a huge collection they've got like you know these cases and they open them up and you know everybody comes and you know opens the various kinds of fountain pens and god knows what not wow. uh, uh i'm not too fancy from that point of view a normal pen and paper is has, has typically been okay for me a big pen i typically use uh yeah that does my job uh <laughs> amit what do you think about it the science of holding a pen and paper and you know how how how's your journey been into that yeah so i'm sorry for that i'm not a gadget guy and uh, i'm mostly a pencil guy um, and now that i'm at home i can uh, when i was working from office uh, you i was more into pens um, i i did had a few pens in in my collection but then uh, i've always been a guy who's sharpening pencils and you know drawing things and keeping <laughs> it down we will for writing so yes but uh, to to your question uh, the science of pen uh, or and paper and i think visual memory is more um, long lasting mm. uh, the the right hemisphere is what uh, works with your visual memory and uh, that helps you to retain things longer uh, it is so uh, important that uh, when you flip through your old pages old notes uh, you can kind of try to remember you, you remember what the context of the conversation was even if it is from ages ago what a great uh, point and that's again uh, through the whole uh, principles of and theory of um, where visual memory resides in fact as much as i know that uh, visual memory has the largest storage space in human brain so I means mm. if you put it in context so that's why we have more visual that than true. space i think that's a great segue to the next topic so i think another area that probably needs a podcast episode of its own is information radiation uh, but perhaps i would briefly touch on this topic from the perspective of how sketching and visualization in information radiation helps and you know, helps us and helps the whole team i specifically like how you know alister cockburn defines an information radiator so he says that you know i mean for those who may not know he is the co-author of the agile manifesto and he says an information ra- radiator displays information in place where passers by can see it so with information radiators the passers by don't need to ask questions you know the information simply is hits them as, as they are kind of passing by and that's a definition i really kind of uh, relate to and 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 adore uh, and some of you may know about the famous anden boards and the anden cords of that you know that toyota implemented if not read the toyota way or let's see if we got time in the podcast to talk about it but uh, mohit what's your view in terms of how sketching can help in information radiation or uh, perhaps information radiation in general how you use it or how you see it if i if i talk about uh, you know information radiator it it's it's something that is part and parcel or an integral part is what i feel right so it, like you know that there are some key fundamentals which which i always try to think when there is something that to be communicated right so it's all about you know to whom it is being communicated right that's that's very important what is the context around it and what is the message so if we are able to you know keep three these three things tie them together i think this helps a lot now if i talk about some of the uh, practical examples where it helps or facilitates our day to day lives is you know it, it's throughout the journey right uh, right from the day when you have got a problem statement or an opportunity space that's where you try and understand different aspects you know starting from your market researches um, and and then also you know once you go next step like you know this user personas the user journey mapping and and, and empathy maps so all these are information radiators right so it might have a different form and way 
but uh, you know how see i'm not a very big fan of all these templates but i think they have a significant way to uh, you know uh, communicate something which is intended for that context so from those perspective these are very powerful things and and even you know throughout these development cycles that we always look across that's where you know how you communicate to your teams your bas and other stuff and how you actually pitch in uh, you know those aspects so miro is something that i use a lot it has got lot of templates lot of thing where you can you know put in any of these uh, you know different different aspects that you want to go it even for a retro right a, a simple way if you want to pass in the actions or any other thing so it it's really important and i'll just uh, try to see you know when it everything is in place how do you actually uh, get it to the next level which is the gtms and other stuff so that's where you know how you communicate to the markets your sales channels your communication channels your collaterals right um i i remember one of my last uh you know engagement where we are trying to pitch in something new in the market and that's where you know we were debating around where this should be placed like we know this is the information that is to be there but it has to be placed at a separate proposition so where it should sit out so i think that place where it sits down and the context and the background i think that that's what matters most to my intent and i don't see there is any single place where we need not to radiate the info right being the ceo of the product or so called ceo of the product we are actually uh, you know kind of expected to be very transparent very visible as well as communicate the right thing so i think that, that that's my take on the information radiator and and my journey that has been so far so i mean what information is getting radiated to you right now or when you're working or what are the kind of information radiators to you or your teams use uh so i'll talk about a concept a little bit and then about yeah. my team also so th- this i love these like this one so i have a lot of printed t-shirts uh, which i wear everywhere and uh, they make for great conversation starters um they definitely tell what kind of a mood i am in and what kind of conversation they can have with me um outside of my house there is a small joke uh, written there which is just like a two to three liner joke so anybody who enters my house always enters with a smile whether they like it or not okay so i think information radiators are actually they bridge the gap between people Uh, humans really and what we want them to do or how we want them to align so nobody enters my house with a grumpy face uh, that happens and uh, and the reason why i like that the whole concept of information radiators is because uh, in offices also people print out their vision and goal statement and stuff like that and they print it out everywhere just so that it is visible to everyone okay and especially in banking Uh, banking they would be like customer is the king and etc and but inside they would have very different posters <laughs> on profitability yeah. and how to extract a lot of interest but okay anyway so the the point being i think it's very important to get information radiators right as well so okay. instead of just saying like very wild uh, long sentences of this is what we want to do uh, again symbolic and that is where sketching comes into be using symbols using iconography using good uh, communicative pictures maybe imagery helps a lot so instead of just laying out a vision statement if you associate it with a certain illustration uh, that goes very far and i can tell you the a very but the most practical usage of information radiator is by the bharatiya janata party uh, using all our vaccination records for pm modi's photo right uh, so his uh, so there was a statistic saying the notes printed the new notes printed versus the vaccination records which got printed there was 2 billion of us right 2 billion population everybody had to get vaccinated so everybody knows pm modi's face not just us but even when you cross border and you have to produce a vaccination certificate for your uh, let's say immigration or whatever it is everybody knows that there's a prime minister's photo on your uh, vaccination certificate so we have examples practical as well as live examples of information radiators all around us and uh, they're the best way how uh, humans can be made part of the entire thinking process or alignment process everybody kind of gets aligned Uh, very fast and very quickly that's that's brilliant 
I mean, it's just kind of uh, like there's so much of information radiator or that topic around product management. I love to kind of have a kind of podcast around it, but too tempted yes, to sir. share some very, very crazy stories about information radiation. But Amit, over to you. Interesting. Uh, information radiation or uh, you know spreading of information in the right way. Uh, I had this. Uh, I, I happened to listen to this talk by um, Anurag Saxena. He's he's founder of uh, One Card, and he gave this uh, example of why banks have big shiny buildings. So and and he was from ICICI Bank. So he said that on all of their credit cards, debit cards, and savings account, they would print that big building which is there in BKC to give a impression that this bank is so big and so huge they would not you can trust them with your money so most of the banks have their offices in the central business district they would have bigger offices though they can always have offices in suburbs and save some money but you know they try to be in the cbd uh, to perceive a notion that they are big and our money is safe with them um, the buildings act as information radiators the the fact where there's trust in product management i think uh, when the whole concept of product roadmap started uh, that was uh, while there are issues with it but then uh, the now next later product roadmaps they were uh, very helpful in telling the teams and and you know marching giving marching orders of what we do now next or later so uh there there have been more iterations but this one is uh, an amazing thing um i i do like uh, i'm still a fan of product road maps and how they help uh structure the vision of a product uh, and and yeah other artifacts yeah, as well i'd love a podcast sometime on product road maps but i have many interesting stories to share about information radiator but one i i will share about information fridges do you know what they are and if you can think fridges. of it, fridges information fridges okay what are they so so i heard this phrase in the book called kanban in action if any of you not read that book i highly encourage you to go read it it's it's just amazing and Uh, the author talks about uh, you know kind of compares information radiators to information fridges where digital tools sometimes you know and he says that they kind of become information refrigerators in which information is hidden <laughs> right so you have to like just like in a fridge you have to you have to know where to look at you have to be able to use the tool you have to be authorized uh, it takes effort to go into the tool and so on you know it's the opposite of kind of radiating the information you know so In, in jiras and all these information is hidden and you kind of go inside you're going to look and try to find where the information is yeah. and uh, uh would you believe we uh, we actually made a mission or i made a mission and kind of got the whole team to rally around it we delivered a whole e-commerce uh product from off the wall so we literally did not use any jira any Uh, uh you know what, what was that tool at that point in time uh x x thought works tool similar to jira forgot, forgot the name pingle uh, pingle sorry mingle right mingle mingle yes mingle yeah something like that yeah so i think those tools were getting used and you know we were going to deliver this right uh, directly off uh, of our own of our own uh, uh, wall that that the team had and you we were just kind of delivering the project right off stickies and everybody could just come and see what we were doing and things like that but yeah i think i think i'm a really big fan of information radiator so great topic guys great to hear what you all have to say coming to the end of the podcast this has been really cool um uh, i think we did touch on design thinking and how sketching helps in design thinking i do have some photographs to share from one of the workshops that uh, amya mohit and i facilitated in pune so maybe i'll quickly share them and i'll move to closing thoughts just some pictures on how kind of sketching uh, brought out the whole 
visualization and thought processes that you know, thought that people have to kind of bring it out in the open. Uh, and you know, a picture speaks a thousand words. And like Ame was showing, you could actually go into the pictures, think about what the people have been thinking. So it's kind of a gallery walk. So you put all those pictures, and people go through it, and highly uh, engaging, high, highly collaborative. Uh, so I just thought we'll show a few pictures that came out of a design thinking workshop that in that that needed sketching. Uh, all right, closing thoughts. That was brilliant, guys. Uh, how would you like to conclude? So yeah, I mean, so okay, I would highly recommend uh, visual thinking or sketching for anybody who probably has not attempted it. Um, it's not a mandate. It's of course one of the techniques which helps you unblock yourself. So if you're dealing with a lot of ambiguity, a lot of abstraction, uh, just try it. Or you can always take guided support. Uh, maybe call me over. I mean, I'm absolutely available for this topic for sure. Uh, it excites me a lot. So yeah, just go ahead, uh, hold a pen and a paper and start sketching. Bring your ideas to life on paper first. It is much easier to realize them digitally later. That that's all for me. No, I think pretty well aligned. Like people, if if in case you fall in my bucket who have taken up sketching and everything later in the life, I would suggest please do it. It's it's my sincere request. It's it's really useful and powerful. Keeping aside any role you are playing, any domain you are into, I think it it brings in a lot of value from overall perspective. There's one learning for me. I think uh, that that's more about I should do more sketching than I do today, right? It, 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 this is also take a lot of interesting insights that I could hear from all of you. Yeah. Awesome. That's, that's that was one thing that you wanted to get out from the podcast today to encourage people to kind of get to do more sketching. So that's lovely. Amit, keen to hear what you have to say today. I think I'm still a learner of sketching techniques. Uh, <laughs> Still very uh, in my early days to uh, turn sketching more into the thoughts and the and and learning new techniques every day. But what I've realized is that sketching helps you bring focus. And as we are in the product, most of us are product managers or have been in a similar roles in product com companies. And having not losing your focus is the most paramount when everyone else is losing theirs. So sketching is what helps me do that. Um, cool. Putting my thoughts pen on paper helps me do that. So yeah, if you haven't tried it to any of the listeners, please do so. It's it's fun. Lovely. All right. Hope you all enjoyed the podcast. Do share your feedback in the comments and thanks Amea for giving me a chance to facilitate or host the podcast today and as you typically like say it. bye bye <laughs>